Hi and welcome to Edu Gurukul. So today we are going to start with the third chapter that is the nature of sources and historical construction. I hope you have been watching all our previous videos and please keep revising because revision is the key to success when it is UPSC. So to begin with, what contributes to know about the history? So what is history? As we have discussed in the previous class, history is a kind of inquiry or knowledge which is acquired by investigation. And then when we see about what are the sources, historical sources, we see that historical sources are of various types. So if I, if I write here that historical sources Historical sources is again of two kinds. The first one being the archaeological sources. Archaeological sources. The second one being the literary sources. Right? So literary sources. Now in archaeological sources, what it comprises of? It comprises of monuments, coins, uh, pottery, etc. In literary sources, we again have various forms. It can be Indian literature. Broadly, if we see, it can be Indian literature, right? Or it can be the foreign literature. Foreign literature. In foreign literature, again, we have the travel logs, etc. In Indian literature, again, if we break it down, we have the religious and the non-religious literature, right? So, there are these various kinds of literatures that contribute to the uncovering of history. And that is why history is so enriched because we get to know from these sources but apart from that, if we talk about the archaeological so, uh, sources, so what do we mean by archaeology? So archaeology basically is the science which enables us to dig the old mounds. So it is the science which helps to dig the old mounds, right? helps to dig the old mounds uh, in a systematic manner. So write down in a systematic manner. And basically it helps us to know about various cultures, various periods, right? So it helps to recover the material remains from ancient, medieval and modern period. So it helps to uncover all of this. Now, this remains are subjected to scientific examinations also, which we will read further, which is done by radiocarbon dating, pollen analysis or dendrochronology. So, these are further, you know, these fossils and everything, they uh, are having a scientific examination as well. So, what is prehistory basically? So, from archaeology, why this archaeology is important? It is because it is used to study prehistory and ancient history. Why it is important? Why? It is because it helps us to understand and to study about the prehistory and ancient history. Now, what is prehistory? So, UPSC is about why, how, when, where. So, these are the questions which are very important. You should keep asking this question to yourself again and again to get in-depth knowledge about the topic. So now when we see what is prehistory, this is very important to understand that it was a period where there was no written sources, right? There was no written sources, while history is based on written material. So prehistory is the time when there was only these fossil remains, plants, animal remains. It was basically the stone age, the tools that gives us the knowledge about history of those times about the civilizations 
Now, as you can see here, this is the archaeological excavation. This is the archaeological excavation. So, what is excavation then? This is a very important question. Excavation helps us to uncover or to remove these extra layer that we have. It is to remove the extra surface of material, right? So, what is excavation? If I write here, basically, it is carefully removing. It is carefully removing the surface material, right? It is carefully removing the surface material from the earth. To find out the buried, to find out the buried remains. Please keep a notebook with yourself. Keep noting down because these notes will be very, very beneficial for you. We have tried to amalgamate RS Sharma, NCRT and all the important material so that you can have this one go revision before the exam and this material will be more than enough for you to crack this examination. So please keep a notebook and a pen with you and keep jotting down the points. It is very important. Now, moving on. So where are these archaeological remains found? Basically, they are found here in the plateaus, mountains, river banks. And we get to see that uh, in India, basically, there was this existence of writing by the 3rd millennium BC. But still, it has not been deciphered. As we all know that Harappan civilization and the Chalcolithic cultures, they all are placed in the proto-historic phases. And still, they lack the decipherable writings. We have seen writings just like this, isn't it? But still, they lack writing. It is the most mysterious writing in the world, as mentioned. And this is where we try to connect the dots. This is the current affairs. Right? Next. So, decipherable writing in India started from when? Agar nahi tha, then kap se shuruad hui? For writing in India. So, decipherable writing started from the 3rd century BC. From the Ashokan inscriptions we get to see. It is from the Ashokan inscription we get to know about the decipherable writings. Now, we see that the archaeological remains, which are an important source for historians, that despite the use of Vedic and post-Vedic literary sources, how these are important because they tell us about the civilization, about the society, about the economy and lot of things. All the spheres we have, it covers. So, Ashokan inscriptions, if you can see here, this is the writing, which has been deciphered, which tells us about those days. It tells us about the dynasty, about the kingdom, about Ashoka's uh, rule, his contributions, his society, and what more. Now, you can see here, this, this is the excavation of mounds. This is the excavation of mounds. Now, as we discussed, what is excavation? Excavation is basically removing the surface material to get uh, the buried remains. Right? So, basically, it is to understand the aspects, the various aspects, the material culture. So, this, this just not only helps us to know about the culture, but also the material culture. Right? Also to know about the material culture, to know about the civilization, to know about the burial practices. Right? It tells us about the kind of ornaments as we can find or the, um, or the clothings. It also helps to tell us about the grains, etc. Right? So, these mounds uncover lot of things. Lot of things, right? And as you can see that there has been various types. Just like this is one type, this is one type. So, there is this horizontal and vertical. Right? So, what do we get from these kind of uh, excavations? 
as there are these two types of excavations that is horizontal and vertical we will see in a bit while so here you can see the vertical excavation is lengthwise digging right it is the lengthwise digging and it uncovers the period wise sequence of culture this is very important for you to understand if in uh, you might get a question uh, in your mains so this will help to write the answer so your basics should be very clear so the lengthwise digging helps to uncover the period wise sequence of culture again if we see this is horizontal so it it gives you a good chronological sequence of the material culture now what is horizontal excavations horizontal excavation is digging the mound as a whole right as a major part of it but it is very expensive and also we do not get the complete picture the complete picture is not clear from the horizontal excavations so we we still it is difficult for us to you know and it is very expensive as it is mentioned so vertical is always preferred now ancient remains vary in levels of preservations so if i talk about see in in dry areas just like uh, or arid regions if i talk about the climate or the climatic relevance so this is the climatic relevance in dry arid regions you will find just like in up uh, rajasthan and north northwestern areas it is better preserved but in the moist areas just like in the mid gangetic plains or the deltaic regions uh, you know it, it does not survive it you cannot preserve these remains it is very difficult to find those remains and only the burnt bricks or stone structures are well preserved in the gangetic plains so you have to understand this that what is the relevance of climate in preservation of all these historical remains now excavations in baluchistan reveals settlements established right so what do we get from all of these all of these remains what do we get so basically we uh, or what is the significance if i talk about the significance is it has brought to light the cities right so if i talk about the significance of excavations so basically it has um, helped us to discover or recover various cities lost cities right which people established around 3500 bc in northwestern india right it also helps to uh, tell us about the material life or the material culture these are the relevance or the importance of excavation it also helps us to tell about the burial practices and so on so if we see that the excavations in baluchistan it reveals about the settlement which was established 6000 bc around 6000 bc it was established the material culture developed in gangetic plains in the second millennium bc and the excavation shows the layout of settlements basically this is the significance we are talking about so first it helps us to understand about the settlements which are very old then it tells us about how the material culture developed this is a second point it tells us about the layout of settlement the types of pottery the forms of houses it goes in the settlement only about the cerals as we discussed earlier it also tells us about the tools used now it also tells us the about the burial practices in south india which had which, where we can see that there were tools weapons pottery etc uh, which all were you know buried with the dead body there were these megaliths also so some large stones and it shows about the burial practices so the archaeology enables us to understand this that how was the life how was the life it also helps us to uh, dig the old mounds to understand the material life of people from the old or the iron age in the deccan areas 
right? So it helps us to understand history in a much better way. So that was all about excavations. Now the megaliths found in the Deccan, you can see all of these. The pictures helps us, you know, every time the pictorial representations is uh, better for, uh, you know, a better retention. You try, uh, tend to remember things in a better way. So that is why we have tried to put in the pictures from time to time so that you can see and just remember this. So these are the megaliths from Deccan. You have to remember the place, the stone alignments in Hanam Saga, right? And these are the megaliths found in Deccan. Next, so what is the method used? As we talked about it, that there are various scientific methods to examine it was the methods to examine um, the archaeological okay <laughs> remains right so basically how we can do this as you can see that uh, what is radiocarbon dating radiocarbon dating is uh, basically a method so it dates as you can see the dates are fixed using various methods radiocarbon dating is the most important ones so carbon 14 is a radioactive carbon which is present in all living objects so this carbon 14 is present and the decay of carbon 14 takes place in a uniform rate so when the object is living right so when the object is living and the decay is neutralized by the absorption of carbon 14 you get to know about the age right you get to know how many years old the fossil is about so when the object is dead c14 content continues to decay with but it ceases to absorb the carbon-14. So it tends to absorb. And the age of the ancient objects that determine, uh, which is determined by the measuring uh, loss of carbon-14 content. So it is the carbon-14 which is present in the living organisms. It again decays in a uniform rate. Further, the loss of carbon-14 helps us to understand about the age of the object, right? That is easy. The next is that if we see that uh, no antiquity or uh, older than 70,000 years can be dated by this method. Again, it has certain limitation. And what is the limitation? You can see that this is the limitation. Right? This is a limitation that there is no antiquity that which is older than 70,000 years and it can be dated by this method. Now, you can see this is the diagram. This is a carbon-14. There are these three isotopes of carbon that is C12, C13, C14 and these all are absorbed by the living organisms, right? So at death, you can see 100% of carbon-14 is there. After a few years, there is 50% after it is lost and then 25% and 12.5%. So you get to know about the age through carbon dating. There are other methods also I would like to discuss here. The next one is the pollen analysis. It is the pollen analysis, right? The pollen analysis is the history of climate and vegetation, right? It helps us to, uh, to know about the history of climate and vegetation. And basically it is uh, done through the examination of plant residues. So it is done by the examination of plant residues fine and it suggests that around uh, 7000 to 6000 bc agriculture was uh, practiced in rajasthan and kashmir through this we get to know the next is dendrochronology it is dendrochronology so by this 
we can get to know uh, the date of the wood right it helps us to know about the date of the wood when it is arrived or the age by counting it is done by counting the number of rings by counting the <clears throat> tree rings in the wood right now so the history of climate and vegetation as as we have discussed this already it helps to tell us about uh, how the climate and vegetation was and it helps to analyze um, about the kind of plants and animal species were there it helps us to tell us about the metal technology which was developed during those days so this is what we have already discussed now the geological studies these provides us about knowledge about the history of soil rock etc the biological studies provide about the history of plants and animals <clears throat> you can see that the geological and biological advances enables us to understand prehistory in a better way right so it helps us to understand everything from the root right from the origin of the earth how these species started to evolve and how we are here in a much better version so that is why prehistory is very important now if we discuss about the coins this is another source which helps us to understand about history right it helps us to understand about history so the coins they are you know very important to know about the economy of that period so the study of coins is known as numismatic right and in those days which metal was basically used it shows about the development the kind of uh, scientific or cultural development that the period had so whether they used copper whether they used silver gold etc and how they were made the technology to be made so it tells us about metal technology it also tells us about um, manufacturing or how what technology basically was used to make these coins so you will see that mostly from the kushan period you will find uh, these burnt clay coins were made right so there were the, these molds from where you make the coins it was basically in the kushan period and then we see that there was a decline in these molds there was a decline in these molds in the post gupta period so people stored money in earthenware how we have seen our gullak and all right the brass uh, vessels etc so they used to because that was the very precious hoards for them that was just like their bank accounts that we have now uh, and we have also seen them in museums in our neighboring countries that how people used to store money then we see that some of the indian coins have been also transferred to britain during the british rule and the coins of major dynasties have been catalogued so you can see that people have kept it just like i i have this tendency of uh, collecting coins and uh, keeping it with me in a uh, album because it tells us a lot about a country just like in indian coins you can get to see our leaders beautiful places about the time and how the coins have changed the change in the coins also tells us about the change of society so these many coins are catalogued and kept in museums just like you can see these are the coin molds right these are the coin molds these are the molds and this is the coin so which which basically it also tells us about um, which deity they used to worship right which deity they used to worship and um, which king was there so it tells us about religious thing which is the god and the goddesses it tells us about the kings or queens etc very important things 
whatever was important was there in the coin fine so coins contain the symbols of kings as we discussed now the uh, the divinities the names the dates etc so coins found in certain areas helps us to reconstruct the history of the ruling uh, dynasties just like the indo greeks and it includes payments donations medium of exchange etc it is also very important as we get to know about the guilds of merchants goldsmiths etc they issued coins with the ruler's permission so again it was not that anybody can come up and do this uh, or make a uh, 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 this uh, thing that is a coin it was only after the consent and the permission with all due permission of the ruler so the largest number of coins date to uh, post maurya period and were made in various materials so the gupta dynasty is uh, it issued the largest number of gold coins indicating trade and it uh, the commerce flourished during uh, gupta dynasty is been shown from the material culture as you can see here that the largest number of indian coins were found in the post maurya period right and the gupta dynasty issued the largest number of coins see you can see here it is the largest number of gold coins it means that if there were gold coins there were trade and commerce which flourished which was in a successful state and few coins we find out from the post gupta period which indicate that there was a decline there was a decline in trade and commerce now coins portray the kings and the gods so it is a symbol of religion a symbol of legend you will get to know all the important people the kind of art it had right it gives us the kind of uh, uh, development of minds of the people and then we see that there were these cowries right which were used as coins with low purchasing powers so mainly in the post gupta times we get to see the use of cowries because there was decline in trade and commerce so when there was if if uh, you should understand from this when uh, trade and commerce was uh, flourishing it was in the it was basically in the gupta dynasty and in what period it started to decline it was in the period of a uh, post gupta period right and the next thing is the coins of kuru janapads the coins of kuru janapads can be seen here this is a coin of kuru janapad this is a coin of magad janapad this is a mauryan coin coins of kanishka in greek scripts with an illustration of buddha on the reverse and this is the various types of coins of the chandragupta period now we have got a question this is very interesting as we promised you in educurukul we will keep you updated with all the questions from which sections they are coming so that it helps for better understanding that which topic should be read how and which topic should be given utmost importance so in upsc mains 2017 you can see this was a question how do you justify the view that the level of excellence of gupta numismatic art is not at all noticeable in later times so you can talk about the trade and commerce and how it flourished during the gupta period and why do we notice that in the later times it was diminishing so how do you justify you can write the answer now i think so because we have completed that topic now we come to inscriptions inscriptions are again very important thing so inscriptions also tells us uh, tells us about history right so inscriptions are most important than coins it is mentioned here that even it is more important because it tells in depth about your uh, dynasties kingdoms contributions if somebody made a, a canal or a water body or a well for people that was also mentioned so everything is more elaborately mentioned in the inscriptions 
Now the study of inscriptions are called epigraphy, right? What is it called? Epigraphy. Study of coins was known as numismatic. Study of inscriptions is known as epigraphy. And the study of old writings is known as paleography, right? So you have to understand all of these terminologies because it is something very basic you should know, right? So inscriptions were carved on various materials such as the stone pillars, temple walls, copper plates, rocks, wooden tab tablets and bricks, right? And uh, the earliest inscriptions in India were recorded on stones. You can see huge stones in all the monasteries. If you have been to uh, all the Buddhist monasteries, you will get to see these heavy inscriptions. And uh, But later on, there was this copper plate which was used and engraving inscriptions on stones continued basically in large scale in the South Indian regions. Right In South Indian regions, you can see that there were there. In Harappan inscriptions again, you can see the pictographic scripts. In Harappan civilization or in Harappan inscriptions which is yet to be deciphered. In Harappan inscriptions, it was the pictographic script. Fine? Which is not yet deciphered. So the largest number of inscriptions can be found in the office of the chief epigraphist at Mysore. And the earliest inscriptions <coughs> were written in Prakrit and later Sanskrit was adopted. So you can see the importance of uh, or the relevance of language here. That the earliest were written in Prakrit and Sanskrit and later, you know, initially it was Prakrit but later it was Sanskrit. The regional languages can be known right and uh, uh, the inscriptions were used and written in the 9th and the 10th centuries so most inscriptions from the Maurya and post Maurya Gupta period have been published in a series of collections called the Corpus Inscriptionum Indicarum right the pronunciation should be proper so that you understand and remember this if ever you get a question that what is the series of collection of the inscription known as so this is the answer where you can find the inscriptions of the Mauryas, post Mauryas and the Gupta period. So in the case of South India, the topographical lists of inscriptions have been published. There is a proper list which shows you about the chronology and the sequence and it is much better arranged. So over 50,000 inscriptions can be uh, found from South India and it still awaits publication. It is yet to be deciphered. You can see this is the copper plate inscription. And see the kind of copper it uh, uh, was used during those days. Abhi the crust it nahi laga hai isme, you know, even if laga hoga, it wo easily remove ho sakta hai. You can still get a very good quality of copper compared to these days. So Harappan inscriptions were written in the pictographic script as we discussed. Now Ashokan scripts were mainly written in Brahmi scripts. Usko left to right likhte the. Usually, how do we write? We write it from left to right, right? How do we write? Just like this. This is the Brahmi script. But in the Kharoshti script, you have to remember this. It is from right to left. So, they may be right like this. Okay? From right to left. Now, the Brahmi script was used all over India except, except the northwestern parts. The Greek and the Armanic uh, scripts were used for Ashokan inscriptions. It was basically in Pakistan and Afghanistan. So the Brahmi script remained dominant always until the end of Gupta period. Brahmi was important. Kaptak? It is very important to remember till Gupta period. Till the end of Gupta period. So decipherable Indian inscriptions were there up to 7th century which requires mastery of Brahmi and its variations. So you get to know about scripts from the inscriptions also. So how important is, you know, everything is interrelated from coins to inscriptions to these manuscripts. Everything is interrelated. It helps to know about history in a much better way. These are the Harappan inscriptions, yet to be deciphered as I told. So seals of Harappa consists basically they are symbolic, 
right and um, you can see that earliest inscriptions were deciphered basically they were the ashokan inscriptions they were written both in prakrit scripts and brahmi so it throws light on modern culture ashoka's achievements basically two ashokan uh, inscriptions are there which were found by firoz shah tughlaq in 14th century ad right there were these two inscriptions which was found by uh, this firoz shah tughlaq so i want to tell you here that it was uh, james princep it was james princep in 1837 he completed the chart he completed the chart of ashokan alphabets through ashokan pillar inscriptions right so where it was found by firoz shah tughlaq there were two ashokan pillars which were found so they were at merat and topra these two were found by mera uh, at merat and topra so pandits of tughlaq in uh, empire failed to decipher these and who deciphered this already discussed now the same difficulty was again faced by the britishers they could not and that is why the first decipher uh, first it was deciphered by james princeps by it was from the east india company in bengal earliest deciphers in inscriptions in iran right and written in old indo iranian and uh, semitic languages in this script so basically it speaks of iranian conquest of hindu or sindhu areas right then we see that there are various types of inscriptions this is very important to understand because you can get about explain about the types of inscriptions what do they tell or what is the significance so in various types we see that uh, it conveys uh, some some uh, convey about the royal orders decisions of the social religious and administrative matters ashokan inscriptions belong to this category right they tells us basically about the decisions of the king the orders the religious and administrative matters now there are some which are votive records so just like the followers of buddhism and jainism used to make it so they are, they are the pillars or tablets temples images these all marks uh, devotion basically it is the votive records the next is about the eulogic uh kings and it is about the eulogy you can say that it is basically about the king uh, it it ignores the weaknesses of the kings it only tells us how he conquered this part how he was so great and you can find about this from samudra gupta's inscription which is the elabad pillar right it, it is a eulogic uh, inscription now some are donative records this like which king gave what kind of uh, uh, donation and it was basically for the religious purpose now the inscriptions recording land grants were also there which are very important to study land systems and administration so it ek inscription se hame kitna kuch pata chal raha hai ki ek king kaisa tha king ka uh, administration kaisa tha uska land system kaisa tha religious purpose or religious or religion kaisa tha us waqt क्या वो लोग तब डोनेट करते थे बट ऑल ऑफ दिस सम हाउ इग्नोर द वीकनेसेस इट ओनली टॉक अबाउट द अचीवमेंट्स सो दिस वॉज मेड बाय द चीफ्स एंड द प्रिंस एंड एनग्रेव ऑन कॉपर प्लेट्स दीज वेर द रिकॉर्ड्स एंड दे वे बेसिकली रिटर्न इन प्रकृत संस्कृत तमिल तेलुगु दिस इज द अलाहाबाद पिल्ला एज यू कैन सी स्टैंडिंग टॉल एंड स्ट्रॉन्ग टेल नाउ एंड देन यू कैन सी एन अदर क्वेश्चन हियर प्लीज answer in the comment section so this is the upsc prelims question in 2020 who among the following rulers advised his subjects through this inscription whosoever praises his religious sects or blames other sects out of excessive devotion to his own sect with the view of glorifying his own sect he rather injures his own sect very severely 
So what should be the answer? Please answer in the comment section below. Somehow, आपको ये सोचना है कि इसमें से सेक्यूलर कौन था थोड़ा सा जो रिलीजन यू नो सारे रिलीजन को एक साथ लेके चलता था सो दैट शुड बी द थॉट बिहाइंड इट नाउ द नेक्स्ट इज इन 2016 दिस वाज अनदर क्वेश्चन दैट हु ऑफ द फॉलोइंग हैड फर्स्ट रिसीवर द एडिक्ट्स ऑफ एम्पर अशोका सो यू बेटर नो द आंसर एंड आई होप टू सी ऑल द आंसर्स इन द कमेंट सेक्शन please try only if you will try we will feel happy to see your comments and your feedbacks it is very valuable for us to work even harder for you to sab zarur koshish kare questions ke answers dene ke liye be it mains or prelims question we will definitely review those question answers now coming to the literary sources so ancient indians they knew how to write as early as 2000 500 BC. So most ancient manuscripts that we see uh, are found in the Central Asia, and they are dating from the AD fourth century. So where and how they were written? Basically, in the birch bark, palm leaves, right? We say them as tal patra or manuscripts, just we can call it that. Sheep leather, right? Sheep leather and wooden tablets. Now the writings are called inscriptions. They are also inscriptions, but equivalent to manuscripts right manuscripts and inscriptions mein kya antar hai so manuscripts highly are valued before invention of printing old sanskrit manuscripts are also found in various parts of india hum dekhte hain ki south india kashmir aur nepal mein ye basically it is found and these are currently stored and preserved in the museums this is the birch bark and palm leaves which are in india so as you can see this so many pages are there how beautifully everything is written so the ancient books contains religious themes right just like the ramayana and the mahabharata is there the ramayana and mahabharata tells a lot about the society of those days and it is just not a religious book but it also gives better understanding about the society right so we get to see that uh, these are the literary uh, literature like the hindu religious literature and it talks about uh, let us consider the veda the ramayan or mahabharata and the puranas that gives us an insight of social and cultural conditions as we as we discussed we see that the vedas are there so that there is rig veda atharva veda yajur veda brahmanas aranyakas and upanishads so i want to tell you there is this very interesting thing if we talk about science yajur veda mein it is mentioned about science right so every veda is having its own importance and relevance every veda is having its own relevance so if i missed upon something i think i should cover this one important portion it is there in the inscriptions so if we talk here i can write there are these foreign inscriptions also right we talked about inscriptions in india we should also talk about the foreign inscriptions basically it was the bogaskoi inscription is there right so basically it is a, a description of an accord which was between hitani and mitani states that mentions about the four vedic deities indra mitra varuna and nasatya you just have to remember the names of the inscriptions just in case you might get questions because exam is becoming very dynamic and unpredictable the next is behistun inscription behistun inscription and naksh e rustam inscription 
So these are the foreign inscriptions, basically description of Iranian and Emperor Darius I. Fine. Now, many Vedic texts are there which contains the interpolations. Mainly, uh, they talk about the beginning uh, or end and contains many philosophical speculations. So, what these Vedas consist of? The Vedas also includes or the Ved uh, Vedangas, they include the phonetics, rituals, grammars, uh, metrics and so on. And, and when there is a as brief prose or uh, precepts are there, they are known as Shudras. The grammar of Panini is a very famous example which shed light on the society, economy and culture of those days. So everything that you read, this is the book. Everything that you read, it is basically about the society of those days. Now, as we are discussing the literary sources, here are the literary sources. So, I should discuss about the, there are these two types of Indian literary sources, that is the religious and there is this non-religious. So, in religious sources, you have all the Brahmanical literatures, Buddhist scripts and Jain literature. Whereas in non-religious texts, you get to know about the Dharma Shutras, Smritis, Kautalya's Arthashastra, Kalhana's uh, Rajataranjani, then there is Ashtadhyayi by Panini and Sangam literature. Fine. There are these two epics and major Puranas were compiled around AD 400, that is the Mahabharat. You can see the Mahabharat is attributed to Vyasa. And it tells us about the state of affairs of, the, of those days. There was originally it had uh, 8,800 verses which was called Jaya, the Mahabharata eventually, you know, it was uh, also later on called as Sata Sahasri Samhita. So this is very important to know what it is called in later days. The Mahabharata also contains about the narratives, descriptives about the Indian history, different periods of Indian history basically. And then there is this another epic which is important that is Ramayan, which is by Valmiki. Right? The important fact is who wrote which epic is there and how, what it comprised of. That is very important for you to remember. And during which date, as in these how many verses, then what it became might not be very important. But the very important fact should be this that what was the epic and when it was written. So, the Ramayan composition started in the 5th century BC and it was by Valmiki, right? It was composed later than the Mahabharat. Post-Vedic periods has a large corpus of rituals. So, ritual was very important during those days. So, we have these ritual books. Shaurashtra Sutra, these names are very important. They prescribe the grand public sacrifices for prince and men of higher varnas. So, Rashtra Sutra prescribes about the royal coronation ceremony. They are like the Griha Sutra, which prescribes about the domestic rituals. And they all date back to 600 to 300 BC. There is another Sutra that is the Sulva Sutra, which prescribes about the sacrificial altars and they mark the beginning of geometric and mathematical study. So, you have to remember which sutra talks about what. Just like Saurashtra talks about the uh, public sacrifices, Griha Sutra talks about the domestic rituals like birth, marriage, thread ceremony, etc. Saurashtra Sutra and Griha Sutra are from 600 to 300 BC. Sulva Sutra talks about the sacrifice uh, official altars and at the beginning of um, geometry and mathematic study. You can see here Katyayan's uh, Sulva Sutra. Now the religious books of Jainas and Buddhists contains historical persons and incidents. Right? So uh, you can see that there were about persons and incidents. So earliest Buddhist text was written in Pali 
and a form of prakrit spoken in magadh or south bihar so compiled it was again compiled in sri lanka in 1st century bc and it reflects the state of affair of india in the age of buddha it also tells us about the life of buddha and his royal contemporaries so non canonical literature which is called as jataka it tells us about the previous births of buddha now the jataka shows about the social and economic conditions everything you can see it shows the social and economical conditions the political state and so also the jataka shows us about the social and economical conditions it also makes the incidental reference to political events in the age of buddha the jain texts which were written in prakrit and compiled in vallabhi in ad 6th century so they contains the passage that helps to reconstruct the political history right these everything that we see it helps us to reconstruct the history right and these texts are repeatedly uh, it refers to trade and the traders they played a very important role there was this question again that with reference to indian history consider the following texts we have the answer here please read the question try to understand at times what also you can do is you can do a bit of research or read a bit about these topics like these texts drop down in the comment section so that others who are preparing with you can also get to know about this only when you share knowledge you gain knowledge so please do share your knowledge regarding these options because options ko refer karte hue bhi aapka deep understanding badhega so try to if you don't know about these options try to read a bit and drop down in the comment section below next the large bodies of secular literature they included law books which was known as dharma sutras and smritis right now dharma sutras they were compiled and they are having this uh, they are basically codified and they prescribe about the duties to be performed by the king or the officials they have this rules for marriage for property holdings inheriting this uh, or properties etc and this is also mentioned about uh, the punishments like if you do any kind of crime what kind of punishment should be given to you now arthashastra is there which was by kotelya it is a very important law book and it is divided into 15 books right and uh, it reflects maurya's era it reflects maurya's era it has very rich material to study about the polity and economy so you can see that how rich was india's political system the administration everything was rich everything was organized it is not that yes every every system has some or the other loopholes but it was well organized it is not that britishers came and made us more organized so you can see uh, it is a piece of news right current affairs so heritage lost original manuscripts of kotelya's arthashastra set to perish due to poor storage conditions these things should be properly preserved because this is pride of india and it should be having proper storage facilities we should not lose this right but we are losing this so it is a piece of information another question for you that is according to kotelya's arthashastra which one of this is correct you can read the question and try to solve this so always try to understand or read between the lines just like in the inscriptions question you have to have a thought regarding which king was more secular or more uh, you know he wanted every uh, religion to stay together same way in arthashastra kotelya's arthashastra you have to think that which one should be correct right what it all tells us about the next is the non religious texts were also there there were uh, just like the grammatical work by panini right ashtadhyayi of panini this book is very important you have to remember these names and uh, there was a panini lived in the north western subcontinent dated to around 450 bc by v s agarwal provides more information about janapats so this book 
uh, provides information about the Janapads or the territorial states that any other text is not providing in so details. Then we have Patanjali's commentary on Panini, right, which is about the postmodern times. We have works of Bhasha, Sudraka, Kalidas, Banabhata, which reflects about the social conditions. Kalidas, if we see Kalidas works of Kavyas and dramas are there. And most famous work was Abhijana Shakuntalam. It is a creative composition which provides the insight into the social and cultural life of Guptas. Another question. So these questions will help to enrich the knowledge that from where the questions are basically coming in. So with reference to the scholars, literatures of ancient India, you have to consider the following statements. You can read the question and solve. We have provided the answer. Right? So Panini is associated with Pushyamitra Sunga or not? You have to read the question properly and answer this. Now, the next is Sangam literature. So, what is Sangam literature? The earliest Tamil texts found in the corpus of Sangam literature, they produced, uh, they were basically produced by the poets in the colleges and they are called Sangams, right? Because over a period of two to four uh, centuries, or three, or three to four centuries, these all have been compiled and made to be a Sangam literature. So, the literature was patronized by the chiefs of or and the kings, right? And you get to know about the societies again from this. It was arranged in eight anthologies. It was in eight anthologies. It was known as Etutokai and basically it had all of these eight anthologies there were two main groups right there were these two main groups that is the 18 lower collections and the 10 songs you have to remember the name it is the pattu pattu that is the 10 songs it is pattinenkil kanaku that is the 18 lower collections so these considered to be the older and the greater historical important Sangam texts have several layers that cannot be established based on the styles and content, but detectable based on stages of social evolution. It tells us about social evolution. Sangam literature is very important to know about the society and they are different from the Vedic texts. They are very different from the Vedic texts, specifically from the Rig Veda. It is non-religious. It is basically non-religious or secular it is basically secular in nature they are composed in numerous poets uh, by numerous poets right and very high quality of literature is found which is not primitive songs but very high quality literature can be seen the gifts made by these figures are celebrated in the poems by the kings and uh, further it is difficult to use for historical purpose but some names and details are partly real everything is not true you know in history most of the things are also exaggerated we will discuss about it in in later times but mostly a lot of things are also exaggerated now some chera kings mentioned in the sangam text appear in inscriptions a major source of information is uh, for the social and economic political life of people again as we keep saying, it tells us about history in a deeper way. And it also confirms about the information about the trade and commerce through the foreign accounts and archaeological finds. So it also refers to Kaveri Patnam, right? Archaeological uh, surveys and uh, from that we have found that the, this trade and commerce place was there, that is Kaveri Patnam. And it also mentioned about the Yavanas who were coming in their own vessels purchasing pepper and they were taking it back they had this women slave supply wine to the natives etc so trade and commerce it uh, the archaeological sources history prehistory they everything tell us about the trade and commerce international trade also you know they talked about international trading also so another question from the same section that 
which one of the following statement about sangam literature in ancient south india is correct so you have to read about sangam poets properly sangam literature properly to be able to answer this if you know it is uh, mostly secular it was non religious so you can answer most of the answers here that it yes it talked about the varna yes it talked about uh, the varna system it did not talked about warrior ethics it uh, it did not talked about the magical forces um, you know and so on so you can a, uh, be able to answer this question easily there was this mains question also that though not very useful for the from the point of view of a connected political history of south india the sangam literature portrays the social and economic conditions of its time with remarkable vividness comment so you have to write about the sangam literature what basically it used to portray through the social and economical conditions so you can mention about everything that we discussed now that how sangam literature contributed to uh, a better understanding of the society it was non religious and uh, you know how it talked about there were these epics there were these uh, eight anthologies also and what was the relevance and importance it talked about trade and commerce etc so you can mention about all of that now the foreign accounts you can see the megasthenes was there he was the greek ambassador right uh, he was in the court of chandragupta megasthenes and the whole country is under tank based irrigation systems and is very uh, prosperous he mentioned about all of this in indica the book name was indica you can see this is the book right so this was the foreign account now the indigenous literature can be supplemented by foreign accounts you see that it it is just like uh, checks and balances you know uh, uh, you can also say that it is somehow being authenticated by the foreign travel logs that we come across by the foreign literatures so greeks romans chinese they all visited india and they wrote about india now alexander's invasion alexander's invasion mentioned only about in the greek sources and it talked about the reconstructed based um, exploits of the reconstructed based on those sources now greek writers mention uh you know mention uh, sandrakotas which was prince chandragupta maurya right as a contemporary of alexander and you know indica of megasthenes just like we talked about it he was in the court of chandragupta maurya has been preserved as a classical writing it gives you a very important data <clears throat> about the mauryan administration social classes economic activities of the mauryan period and again indica is not free from the exaggerations like any other foreign accounts the greeks and romans accounts of first and the second centuries they also mentioned about the ports the ports and uh, the trade about india periplanus of the ithrian sea and the plotinese geography these two are very important sources to know about uh, geography and commerce studies this is very very important now um they all talk about the geography how they used to trade uh, what routes they used to use and how was the trade basically what was uh, in those days red sea persian gulf and the indian ocean they describe everything pliny's naturalis historia is again a very important source which tells us about the trade between india and italy and you can also see that the last greco roman scholar who wrote on india was cosmos right from alexandria so he wrote about the christian topography and he mentions christians in india and sri lanka were referring to the hot strait from where do we get to know about the hot strait it is from this important writing now there were these two chinese travelers wen sang and fa hin so they both were buddhists they visited india to visit buddhist shrines and study buddhism right so fa hin came in a uh, uh, 5th century and wen sang was there in the second quarter of the 7th century and they described about the 
social, religious and economical aspects of India. Wen Tsang presented a similar account of India during the age of Harsha. Another question, please read and try to solve. This is the question which says the Chinese traveller Wen Tsang, another name is written, who visited India, recorded the general conditions and culture of India at that time. In this context, which of the following statement is or are correct? Please read, try to solve. We will provide you the answers very soon. This is another question from Means. Access the importance of the accounts of the Chinese and Arab travelers in the reconstruction of history of India. So how they contributed for the reconstruction of history. Right? They wrote about the social economical conditions, trade and commerce. They wrote about the... Uh, geography like how what was the geography what was the topography hot trade was famous where and they also talked or uh, somehow showed the interlinkage of Sri Lankan people with India uh, and other places right so how and why so you can mention about this in your answer now we will read about village study so relics of communal um, sharing in feasts festivals and pujas reveal egalitarian character of ancient tribal society so there was loyalty to the clan, right? Villages were always very, it is a very uh, have a, a place which has primary relations. So there was loyalty in the clans. Caste was there, but basically they all had cordial relationships. They all had functional relationships, you can say. Every caste was contributing to another. Ancient sects and institutions of marriage, family, they all can be there. Uh, uh, they all were there and they all were surviving rituals. High caste did not perform the manual labor. Promoting untouchability was there. Inequality was is, is not present among castes but between men and women. This is very important that it was not among castes but it was there between men and women. Sati system was practiced in rural parts of Bihar until 1930s. It is very important. Social inequalities uh, were there. Right, and rural uh, rituals and caste prejudices were also there, which reflects Dharma Shastra's rule of ancient Indian society and politics. Natural sciences were there, village studies we have seen now, natural sciences. So, we see that there were found findings uh, from social sciences that uh, there was use of natural science has recently begun. Social science is older, but natural sciences has recently begun with the evidence of chemistry, geology, biology and they all are very relevant because they all were still there in the ancient times as well in some or the other form. Now you can see this news that explains what expedition to Ram Setu could reveal about structure of history myth. So still people are studying about Ram Setu, what is its significance? what and how it was planned etc like how it still uh, stands so strong so they are still being studied there is science for sure during those days also there was some technology there was some sort of understanding that is why this bridge was you know uh, made and it still survives it still thrives now the historical sense, so if you see about the ancient Indians, they were criticized for lacking a sense of history. History was not written in the same manner as uh, it was done by the Greeks. So they were always criticized. Indians were criticized for the ancient Hindi, uh, history. The Puranas provided dynastic history up to the beginning of Gupta rule. The Puranas also mentions about the events and they discuss about the causes and the effects. The statements which were made in the future tense, although recorded after events had occurred, authors of Puranas were again aware that the idea of change is there, which is the very essence of history, right? So this is very important. You can quote, I love this line, that authors of Puranas were aware of the idea of change and they understood that is that this is the very essence of history. Four ages were there, that is the Krita, Treta, Dwapara and Kali. Kali being the worst, right? And every stage will be worse than the previous. There was these four ages, you can see. There is importance of time and place which indicated uh, in the Puranas. 
धर्म एंड अधर्म कॉन्सेप्ट वॉज दे यू कैन सी धर्म एंड अधर्म एंड सेवरल एराज विल बी देर विक्रम संवाद शक्का संवाद एंड गुप्ता एरा द इंस्क्रिप्शन रिकॉर्डेड दीज टाइम्स एंड प्लेसेस अशोका इंस्क्रिप्शन शोज कंसिडेबल हिस्टोरिकल सेंसेस एंड यू कैन ऑल्सो सी इट रिवील्स अबाउट यू नो इट रिकॉर्ड अबाउट द टाइम लाइन अबाउट द ईयर एक्सेट्रा खारवेल ऑफ कलिंगा रिकॉर्ड इवेंट ईयर बाई ईयर इन हाथी गुम्पा इंस्क्रिप्शन सो ईयर बाय ईयर अगर कहीं पे आपको मिलेगा इट इज खारवेल ऑफ कलिंगा राइट इट इज अ हाथी गुम्फा इंस्क्रिप्शन विच इज देयर इन द फर्स्ट सेंचुरी बी सी सो इंडियंस हैव अ वेरी स्ट्रॉन्ग हिस्टोरिकल सेंस इन बायोग्राफिकल राइटिंग्स हर्ष चरित बाय बना भट्टा इज अ वेरी गुड एग्जाम्पल विच डिस्क्राइब्स अर्ली करियर ऑफ हर्षा हिज एंड इट इज हाईली एग्जेजरेटेड ऑल्सो बट it gives you the insight of the court life about the social and religious life later there are various charitas which is the biographies were written and which included the sandhyakar nandi's ramacharitra charita and uh, there was this bilhana's biography by merchants in gujarat so you have to remember these names these names are very important i'm putting a tick mark here harsha charita then there was sandhya karav and then there is bilhanas they all are very important mushika vamsha is another by atul he was from the dynasty of mushika in kerala the best example of earliest historical writings is the rajata ranjini or the streams of kings by kalhana a string of biographies of kashmir kings right kashmir kings and considered to be the first work with characteristics of historical writings as understood today this is very important you have to remember the names who wrote what book or who wrote which biography so constructing history numerous sites excavated and explored in india right so the results are not part of the mainstream ancient indian history social evolution in india requires consideration of prehistory and proto historic archaeology and historical archaeologies so everything is interconnected we have to read them properly to understand the relevance and importance for better creation of history for better construction of history they all are related to each other and we have to find we have to connect those dots right so you can as i kept on saying that it studies social economical cultural trends in ancient times which are not adequately discussed we still need to find and uh, know more about it there is a need for both rural and urban aspects of ancient india to better understand the society why there is need is to be discussed here right so there are still lot of languages which are not yet deciphered we need to know about that which will give us better insights so far significance of buddhist and some brahmanical sites are highlighted so religious history needs to be seen in relation to social and economical developments also so it gives us a different lens religious is not only one aspect you need to see them in interlinkages with the social and economical developments the ancient history constructed mainly on literary sources from the foreign and indigenous accounts coins inscriptions etc they need to adopt new methods right so it is high time we need to adopt new methods to examine the texts to understand the evidence it should be more objective to have validity and reliability it should be more scientific so these things can be done with the scientific examination methods we discussed and this will enrich our historical informations right so full length reports of any uh, excavated sites are yet to be published we need more publications for people to know so we need more examination of this texts as well to authenticate validate and to make it more reliable more scientific we need to do a lot of work there is yet to be done to contribute for a better culture there is this gandhara grave culture that we see so gandhara grave is an archaeological culture of the indo greek period in the northwestern region of gandhara which is now part of modern day pakistan and afghanistan gandhara is a part of pakistan and afghanistan 
So there is a distinct burial, uh, burial practice that we see. There are the stones lined graves and uh, there is we find coins, weapons and jewelry, right? As I told, it tells us the burials also tells us about the jewelry and the uh, kind of clothes they wear, etc. And it provides us important uh, insights that how there was interaction between Greek and Indian civilization during that those days. So you can see this is the place. You can see what all were there, like copper was there, painted grey were. These all were the important things. And now it is in parts of Pakistan and Afghanistan. So we need to establish a correlation between the Vedic and painted grey ware, right? And other archaeological findings. As I told, everything is interrelated and we need to connect those dots. So earlier Pali texts need to be related to northern black uh, polished ware archaeology. And we need to read it in more depth. We need to do more research. We need to come up with more publications so that others should also get to know about it. And we cannot read things in isolations but in interconnections. So the study of Rig Veda age needs to take into account the Gandhara grave culture. You can see the painted grey ware, right? These are the painted grey ware. Now the archaeological evidence is considered more important than Puranic text, uh, traditions because Puran is somebody's thought. It has no evidence. There is no evidence in support. But archaeology is a living evidence in itself, right? So that is why we need to come up with more evidences, with more findings and based on literary tradition and epigraphic material, we cannot just say that, uh, you know, uh, we cannot construct the entire history. So the traditional, uh, the traditional based or the tradition based dates are also needed to be reconsidered. The cities that Buddha or Mahavir visited, we need to come up with better understanding of history, better consideration. If we talk about the grammatical works of Panini and Patanjali, which have fixed dates, are free from myths and legends, right? They are very important for coins, inscriptions and excavations. So many inscriptions have been dismissed and have little historical value. So historical value is very important. It has to be authentic, scientific and real. The royal inscriptions contains these, uh, you know, exaggerated uh, numbers like hundreds and thousands of Ashokan inscriptions. So we do not need the history which is exaggerated. We need a history which is real, which is true. Right. But despite, I would say, uh, exaggerations, these inscriptions are more reliable compared to the Puranic traditions. So here we are discussing about which material or which source is more reliable. And it talks about the political and the religious history. Epigraphic land grants were also there, which tells us about the agrarian structure. Coins are there and they all help us in establishing the history in a more better way. It tells us the history of trade and urban life. The collections of historical material is very essential for reconstruction. right? So the mythology support dominant norms, but events cannot be taken as true. Past practices can be explained through the ancient survivals, right? And the village life. We have to have a comparative view which can remove obsessions with uniqueness and show common trends. We need to find out these common trends. A sound historical reconstruction must consider ancient societies and the developments. This is very important, right? So we need more research which can indicate ethnic mixture and dissemination of culture. That's it. That was all about it. I hope you enjoyed listening to this. And please stay tuned. Revise well. All the best. And we are coming very soon with a new lecture for all of you. Keep revising. Thank you so much.